So hello, everyone, and welcome to PNP Live. My name is Leah, and I'm a bookseller at Politics and Prose, and I truly have the honor of being your host this evening. Thank you so much for joining us and tuning in in this virtual format, which allows us to continue to bring these amazing authors and their important books to readers like you. And I am so excited to welcome our very special guest this evening, Laura Amy Schlitz, as well as Betsy Bird, to celebrate Laura's newest masterpiece, Amber and Clay, this amazing novel. So if uh, you can click on the link that will drop in the chat box um, to get your own copies of Amber and Clay, if you haven't grabbed one yet or grab another copy, um, which will include a signed book plate. Thank you so much, Laura, for sending these to us while supplies last. And also check out Betsy's awesome work, um, including her newest um, Wild Things, which she co-wrote. Um, also, if you have a question this evening for our guests, um, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add one there. And at the end of our chat, our guests will have some time to answer some of your questions. You can also vote on the questions you really want answered by clicking on the thumbs up button. Um, and as always, please remember that this is a creative space safe space, and we ask that friends be respectful of one another in their questions and comments. So again, thank you so much, friends, for joining us today and supporting these amazing voices. So now, on to the event you're all waiting for. It is truly my honor to introduce award-winning author, professional storyteller, and teacher, Laura Amy Schlitz. A master world builder and time traveler, Laura has written numerous critically acclaimed novels for young readers, including the Newbery Medal winning Good Master Sweet Ladies, the Newbery Honor book Splendors <clears throat> and Glooms, and The Higher Girl, which received the Scott O'Dell Award for Historical Fiction and the National Jewish Book Award, just to name a few. The list goes on. In addition to her writing, Laura is also an educator and librarian. And tonight we are celebrating her newest transportive work, Amber and Clay, illustrated um, with illustrations by Julia Erdel. The book beautifully blends artifacts, verse, and prose to bring readers a powerful tale of ancient Greece. It is truly an amazing novel like nothing I've ever read before. So um, it's so great to have such another, uh, another great friend tonight. Laura is joined by beloved librarian, author, and reviewer Betsy Bird. Betsy is the Collection Development Manager of Evanston Public Library and the former Youth Materials Specialist of the New York Public Library. A critical voice in the world of children's literature, Betsy is reviewed for various outlets at Kirkus, um, served in the 2007 Newbery Award Committee, and is a host of several podcasts and blogs, including Fuse Number 8 Productions and Story Seeds. Betsy has also written several children's books like Giant Dance Party, The Great Santa Stakeout, and upcoming picture book, Long Road to the Circus, and co-author of Wild Things, Acts of Mischief in Children's Literature. So now it is my pleasure and honor to pass it over to Laura and Betsy. The virtual stage is yours. Thank you. Hi, Laura. Hi, Betsy. <laughs> How you doing? Very well, thank you. Good, good, good. We were just talking about how long it's been since we've seen one another either virtually or in person. So this is just delightful. And uh, a hat tip to politics and prose for allowing it to happen in some way. So standard operating procedure dictates that our conversation should begin with the origin story of Amber and Clay. Uh, but in my experience, origin stories of novels are not straightforward things usually. It's not always a case of you just stood in a field and you were hit by a bolt of inspiration and whammo book. Um, still, uh, things do come together to create stories. So my question to you then is what elements came together in just the right way to make Amber and Clay? Well, there's, there's a great turning point about this book that I'd like to talk about. I, I wanted for a long time to write a book about Socrates um, and, and about the slave boy in, in the Meno. And um, I thought, of, I mean, it was going to be a picture book. It was going to be a pic, it was going to be paper engineered with Socratic questions. And then you were going to pull a little tab like those old password games. And, but that didn't work out. And and then it was going to be maybe a, a, a children's biography, you know, 32, maybe 64, 48 pages, 48 pages. Um, but the idea sort of sat and refused to be dismissed. And at one point, I didn't have any other idea. 
So I had to start to work on this. And uh, I, was, I was researching uh, Socrates and I, I ran across this passage about these little girls who served the goddess Artemis as bears. And I thought, oh, I, I love bears. You know, I love the idea of these wild child priestesses. And I wanted to write about them, but I thought they would never meet. This boy is enslaved. And these priestesses were chosen from aristocratic Athenian families. And in ancient Athens, boys and girls were in entirely different circles. They would not meet. So I was thinking, well, I can't write about her, but I want to write about her. And I have to write about him because he's the starting point and they could never meet. And then there was a conference and Candlewick Press took me up to New York City and they put me in the library hotel. Well, the library hotel has call numbers. And the first time I stayed there, I was in oceanography with Jacques Cousteau on the walls. And, and the second time I stayed there, I was in Islamic uh, literature with beautiful calligraphy on the walls and poetry on the shelves that I couldn't read. And this time they put me in the paranormal room. And, you know, there were pictures, you know, old fashioned Victorian pictures of seances and Hans Holzer in the bookcase. And I thought, they could meet if one of them was a ghost. Mm -hmm. And that was a turning point because then I realized how these two characters could come together. That one of them, of course, would have to be dead, um, which meant I would have to kill one of them, which I had a little ambivalence about. But, you know, sometimes people have to die to advance the plot. So that was a turning point. Visiting Greece was another one because Greece is so beautiful, so outrageously beautiful. And I, I had been told it was beautiful. I didn't expect it would sort of knock me flat. You have literally touched about 10 of my questions. Oh, I beg your pardon. No, no, no. you <laughs> touched on them. You haven't answered them. But I am having now that um, moderator difficulty. I'm like, well, she mentioned that, but then 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 she mentioned that. Thankfully, I did not have any questions about the library hotel. So that one is okay. But uh, let's, I'm just going to go to the very- Try to, try to stay, in, stay in the lane. Stay no, in the I lane. Let's go with the last thing that you were discussing, actually, because none of us have traveled in a very long time. We miss it. We miss vacations, we miss going to other countries and eating food that is not our own. Um, so you did your research, you went to Greece before the pandemic. And uh, where, so what did you do there? Where did you go? What, what, what did, was the nature of the research that you did? Well, I, I went on an archeological tour. Oh. And as it happened, Bethany Hughes, uh, who wrote the Hemlock Cup, which is a really fascinating uh, biography of, of Socrates. Uh, she was one of the guest lecturers and so it seemed, so I went on this Andante archeological tour. Greece was in its austerity period. So there were archeologists kind of perfectly willing to answer your questions because they, they'd been laid off and they were, they were happy to share their knowledge. So I went to Athens and I went to um, Ellipsis, which, um, you know, the Lucinian mysteries were celebrated there. That's where my watch stopped. And it was interesting because I had um, bought a new battery for my watch before I traveled to Greece. And I got there where these mysteries were celebrated for, for thousands of years. And it was, you know, I saw the cave where the earth split open and Hades grabbed Persephone and dragged her. Uh, under the ground. I, I, I saw that because that's there. And in fact, there were figs and grains of wheat on the ground. Um, and, and then after I had been there, a couple of days later, my watch started up again and worked for the next year. But I, I thought that I saw Delphi and I, I went to Vraron um, to see where the little bears had lived. And it's a, it's a particular kind of a landscape. It's got this very secretive, very female, whatever that means now, 
quality to it. Um, and it, it used to be closer to the sea than it is now. It silted up a whole mile. But at that time, the little girls could leave the temple and rush down to the water. You keep bringing up uh, Socrates, um, which we should probably explain for anyone who hasn't read the book yet. Usually what we would say would be Socrates, um, but you put the correct pronunciation in the book. Actually, I didn't. Um, I, I used that pronunciation in my head. And, and when I was writing the first drafts, I would write the characters' names in Greek because I was trying to teach myself a little Greek, which I did not succeed. Um, but but I, you know, I came to think of him more or less as Socrates. But actually, in classical Greek, it would have been Socrates. Okay. And I didn't know that because there was no one I could ask. It's funny. I was uh, I was watching Hamilton with my daughter the other day, and uh, there's that line: uh, "If not, then I'll be Socrates, throwing verbal rocks at these mediocrities." And I thought of your book. Oh, because like, oh, he doesn't get referenced that often. <laughs> so <laughs> it was nice to see him in a musical, which I think he'd appreciate. Um, was he, so was he always, I guess if this book began as a potential picture book of his, then he was the starting point to a certain point. But I kind of like the idea of him inserting himself in. Was there ever a moment where he wasn't going to be part of the book? No, he was, he was always going to be part of the book. And, and originally I, I wanted to share him but I, I wanted a child's point of view. And there was the child in, in the Meno dialogue. And uh, then I needed to write about the little bears and the two kids edged the adult off stage uh, to a certain degree. And I thought, that, I thought that would probably be okay with him. Yeah, um, I don't think he would. At least certainly not the one that's in your pages. I don't think he would mind. Um, so you also, and you mentioned you, you, have, a, you have a love of bears. Um, and yet, in your books, there have been relatively few. There was the bear skinner, but that bear is pretty much done away with practically on page one. And I know that your Newbery, your Newbery acceptance speech, which is to date um, the greatest Newbery acceptance speech, I believe that's yet existed, and I, I think that's fair to say, um, invoked bears to a certain extent as well. Um, and so... I guess my question is, um, oh, and I, I, I just want to say, I love the bear in your book, the, the one in particular uh, that comes up because I have a cat who must have been taken from his mother too soon and will latch onto my uh, clothing and just with his teeth and while I pet him. And he reminded me of the bear. Yes, <laughs> <book> exactly. <laughs> who very much does that, but more painfully. Um, so why do you like bears so much? I don't know. I, I woke up one morning and I wanted to learn about bears. And I got up and I, you know, went to the library and I took out bear books and, and I took out bear videotapes and I sat there and, and watched bears. And, uh, you know, they, they really kind of haunted me. I, I, I almost saw one one night in, in, in the bathroom and it was, it was a trick of the light, you know, but I, I kind of saw the outline of the rump. And I did go to Churchill, Manitoba after I won the Newberry. That was one of the things, one of the doors that opened to me. And I did, I did see bears there. I looked, mm. I looked into the eyes of a bear. Well, the format of your book is particularly interesting um, because it changes constantly. Uh, and it's, it, you know, it's a big thick book and I you know I, I think some kids will be like oh that's too much and that's already happened you know my kids were like well it's a big thick book and I was like mm, come over here my friend let me just show you what the book looks, looks like inside and they're like oh okay and they were very pleased um was that format always the way you wanted to write it or or did it just sort of naturally form that way in time it's got art it's got images it's got poetry process of elimination I just ended up trying something and if I liked it, I kept it. And then I slapped something else down next to it in the hopes that it would be all right. And sometimes it was, and sometimes it wasn't. I, I threw away more drafts with this book than any of my other books. I was, you know, I just kept making a mess. It's a very, um, it's a very workshoppy kind of book. You know, I just feel like I kind of 
went into the room with the tools and the gunk and just started getting my hands dirty. Um, so it, it ended up in this form, but it, you know, originally it wasn't in verse. And then I started looking at Greek verse and then I started trying to do the strophe antistrophe things. And, you know, I, I, and at one point my, my editor had read the first hundred pages and she said, you know, um, do you know where you're going with this? And I said, I, uh, no, I, th I, think, I think there might be a bear somewhere. <laughs> um, and I think somebody's running at the edge of the water. And she was very, uh, she didn't like say, you're nuts. You know, we can't, we can't buy a book where you just think there might be a bear somewhere. She was very respectful of my complete lostness. But this is the book where I've, I really, I struggled more with Splendors and Glooms because that was a killer. That was a killer. But this one, I was very frequently at sea and I just kept messing. It reads like you're having fun though. It, it does, it yeah. does. It doesn't feel like this was a slog by any. No, it was more like a puzzle that yeah. would periodically kind of yield. You know, I would sort of, eh, I don't know how I understand this. Oh, okay, I'll try that. What didn't you? What What did you want initially to put in at some point, and then it just wasn't wasn't fitting in? Was there anything that you can remember, uh, or anything you wanted to include that, for whatever reason, just couldn't couldn't make it to the end? Um, I can't remember all the stuff I threw out. That's I good. Can't. Don't clutter up the brain. Yeah. 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 There were things that I was surprised that they wanted to come in. And then I thought maybe my editor would make me take out like Alcibiades, uh, his, his little, but, but I wanted him there because he knew. So pronounce his name again, please. Because in the book, he doesn't even. Give no, he doesn't even bother with no, it. No, please um, say his name again. I, I think it's Alcibiades. Okay. Um, and uh, and, and I, I think the English version is usually Alcibiades. Mm -hmm. So I've heard people, you know, on public television say Alcibiades. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I didn't know he was going to be there. There was a certain fiendish joy when I decided to turn a character into an animal. I, I don't want to give away too much, but it was a character who was presenting me with some problems being alive. <laughs> if I had let her remain alive, readers would have been thinking that something that I did not plan to give them was in the offing. So I, 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 wanted, to, I wanted to kill her off, but I couldn't. She just had too rough a life. She had just had too rough a life. And then I thought, well, you know, it's, it's a Greek book. Um, they went in for metamorphosis. Uh, I can change her into an animal. And that was really fun. I went to the aquarium and I watched for two hours and, you know, and then looked at the innards and everything and tried to figure out if I were changed, you know, how would, what's the logistics? Yeah. And it's a nice animal, but there's some people, there's some animals that you just wouldn't want to be turned into in general. It no, was, no, I didn't. That, yeah. No. You made a, you made a lovely, a lovely animal choice. I, I would say, um, it's funny, there's a, I, because I'm a librarian, I cannot read a book without immediately trying to connect it to another book. If only because I guess I was trained on reader's advisory. If someone asks, I like this, then I would have already in my brain, oh, then you will like this. And for me, the book that kept coming up um, as I read this, if only just because of the framing sequence is a single shard by Linda Sue Park, of course, on Single Shard, you're here today and you're seeing this work of art from a long time ago. We don't know the name of the artist, of, but we can figure things out today. And throughout your book, you have images that, of things that kids might see in the museum. And yeah. they'd be like, oh, it's a, it's a doll or it's a, you know, it's a, oh, what's the name for it? Uh, a Strigil? A Strigil? What's the name of it? The the scrapey thing. Yeah, I think yeah. Strigil, but I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't know how to pronounce it either. It's <laughs> gross. I like it. 
Yeah. <laughs> that, I didn't know that thing existed. I had to yeah. look it up afterwards. Yeah, so, and there's the YouTubes of people, you know, trying to reenact, you know, ancient Greek sports with the ancient Greek hygiene at the same time. See, really, it's really gritty, dark stuff that comes off. With yeah. Well, what I like about the fact that you have all these little objects is that you see the object and then you see how it ties into the narrative. And so it gives kids this sense that the past had people in it. <laughs> you yeah. might actually understand the thoughts and opinions and, and emotions of. Um, and that's why we like museums because it is this tie to the past but it's a very hard concept to sort of come up with so and and i guess your your illustrator came up with the depictions of them um were they how you would imagine them um yes yes she did a beautiful job the only thing was that you know in my mind they were frequently static and what the illustrator did was she moved them on the page or she put them in a diagonal and she dramatized the objects. And I was thinking of, you know, kind of museum exhibit catalog things where the object is always in the center of the page, etc. But she gave them a lot more life than there had been in my mind. That's good. You mentioned a little bit earlier that, um, you know, one character and I, this is so difficult, I can't do spoilers. I can't say whom, but a character gets killed off, like just killed off to the point where they get killed off in the book. And I remember reading it and being like, well, wow, that's, that can't, that can't be right. That character, they're fine. They're fine, they're not fine. They're not fine, they're dead. They are dead. Is it, when it is a character you like, it seems that as an author, it would be very difficult to just, just kill them off, um, but you're very good at it. So is there any reluctance at any point to simply not kill them off, maybe, even if it is something that you absolutely have to do for the plot? Well, I, I knew that I was gonna kill her off, but not that I was necessarily going to be done with her. Right. Um, so, um, and I, I had questions about what she would have done in that world if she had lived. Um, yeah. The death of Socrates always kind of breaks my heart. Hmm. You know, just the fact that he was, you know, talking to his friends and still making jokes and drinking the hemlock and, you know, kind of being turned to stone from the bottom up. Hmm. That's interesting. Her death is so fast. There's yeah. really no time to like boop, boop, she said. Um, but his is, yeah, his, his, he gets to say goodbye to everyone. He yeah. is perfectly healthy before he drinks the hemlock. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's a bit I, I, I do, I do look, you know, he really did. His friend said, you know, how should we bury you? And he said, any way you like, if you can catch me. I love that. <laughs> You know, and for ancient Greece, you know, burial was a pretty important thing. You know, those, those, some of those beautiful funeral urns uh, have hollow bottoms because you're going to pour things in there. It's a feeding tube to the person who's lying in the grave. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Huh. Because I've heard of air tubes attached to graves from the days when we had a nasty tendency to bury people alive occasionally. Um, but I haven't heard of a feeding tube before. That's interesting, I like that. It's a lot you can do with that. Well, I think I just have to ask you and then maybe we'll take some questions from the audience as well. But uh, can you say what you're working on next? I'm working on a, a dollhouse book because I wanted to go from the epic to the miniature. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, I hope that it will be one of those books where you read it from this side, you know, and it's all about the old woman and the girl and renovating the dollhouse. But if you read it from this side, it's what's happening to the dolls. Yeah. And the animals. It's great fun to write the animals. We haven't had a good dollhouse book in a long time. I'm searching my brain, but you know, Anne Martin had the doll, those dollhouse books. And then of course, Rumor Godden long ago had the, the dollhouse books. And I always sort of 
chocolate and then there are the spooky the ones, you know, Betty yeah. Good, right? Oh yes, <laughs> that, the Dollhouse Murderers. Yeah, that was that was my youth. That was uh, Scholastic Book Fair. I love I love my Dollhouse Murders, but <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, creepy dollhouses though. There, anyone can do a creepy dollhouse, but. Oh, that's very interesting. And will this be sort of a early chapter book for last lack of a better phrase or, or a longer uh, book? It's younger, younger than younger, younger than this, yes. Very good. All right. Well, folks, if you guys want to put some uh, questions into the QA, feel free. I'm going to go through them and uh, ask them. Uh, looks like a young man by the name of Gregory Maguire has a question. Uh, <laughs> nope, he's just saying hello. Hi, Gregory oh, Maguire. I, but he I, is saying I am listening with rapt attention from my I, room in the library hotel today. You know, I, I have such gratitude to Mr. Gregory Maguire because, um, because he called me volcanic. And he, mm. he needs to know that when I, when I got his, his review, I was in the hospital and mm -hmm. I had had two abdominal surgeries. So I was really quite quite miserable and and suddenly I heard that he had written this wonderful thing about my book and let me tell you I, I began to recover I really did <laughs> and uh, I figure this is this is my one chance to be volcanic nobody ever called me volcanic before and probably nobody ever will again because I'm a respectable middle-aged school librarian but um but I love that I'm just jealous that I can't use it now because it's been done, it's brilliant. <laughs> Shoot, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna wait 60 years and I'm gonna use it. Nobody will know ha, 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 where I got it from, ha ha ha. All right, let's see here. What other questions do we have? Oh, here's a good question from Daisy. Question is, what was your favorite voice to write? Hermes. Oh yeah. Because he was the easiest. He was the easiest. Um, you know, I, I have hidden inside of me a, a very handsome, conceited man. And um, when I can write from that point of view, uh, I'm always very happy. Now, you know, people can't see the handsome man because he's, he's hidden inside of me. Uh, but he's in there and he's, he's very handsome and he has, you know, a lot of... Um, flippancy and impertinence and conceit um so he's 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 a lot of fun well then this question that comes next actually ties in beautifully it comes from a mr stephen barbara uh and he says if he wonders if you could talk about writing from the point of view of gods and is that particularly difficult or is it rewarding i i think it's uh, you know i chose the gods i chose and i i didn't I didn't want to get the whole pantheon in there. Well, um, I'm glad you did Hephaestus. I just want to get that out there because yeah, I Yeah, I like him. I like he's, Hephaestus. He's uh he's like a bass. You know, he's like a bass and Hermes is more like a tenor and I wanted them to have different kinds of voices and um and I think you know, when you think about the gods they sort of don't have much skin in the game. You know, that's, <laughs> you, you feel that when you read Homer too, that um, they're interested in all of this, but they don't suffer and they don't have any real risks. And um, of course, Hermes was, and, and you, my astute friend, pointed this out, was hugely helpful because he could do all this exposition for me. So I didn't have to, you know, say, so she walked down the street and Athens had been at war with the Pelopon you know, the Peloponnesian War. It's been going on for how many years? And, you know, he, he could just say, okay, there's been a war and it's roughly Athens against Sparta. Uh, there were allies, but they changed sides. I'm not gonna bother you with that. And it's, <laughs> yeah. it's done, you know, it's done. Uh, this is what you need to know. Um, so Hermes was easy because he's Hermes. The other gods I had to think a little bit more. And, and Athena, she only narrates part of the trial and she's in the elegiac couplets, um, which 
always require a certain amount of, um, you know, banging on the table, da 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 you know, and so forth. And then there's Artemis who's in there as well, right? Yeah, she's yeah. in there as well, but but more briefly. Yeah, yeah. I can see I can see why Hermes would be. He's charming, and he has a sense of humor. And the women are very strong, good, strong female characters. They're not the funniest people you'll find in Greek. Well, that's an interesting mythology. question. Which of which of the Greek goddesses can you? Well, laughing Aphrodite. You know, oh, Aphrodite yeah, she does is smile. Yeah. described as laughing yeah. Aphrodite. So yeah. there's there's an element of the humorous and the ridiculous in erotic mm -hmm. love. So we can imagine her having a sense of humor. She is it's as close as we get to the female trickster, yes. Yeah, and Athena, surely one cannot have wisdom entirely without humor. That's so true. I would think she would have some. And if the George O'Connor uh, Olympians books have taught me anything, Athena and Hermes do many things together as siblings, um, mm -hmm. do different jobs for Zeus. So I love those books. You can't, I love those books too. <laughs> They're so helpful. Yes, yes. All right, back to the other people's questions, I should say. So how is writing a story in ancient Greece different from writing in your other time periods? This one comes from Elizabeth. Uh, was it more freeing or more difficult? It was more difficult because every time I turned around, there was something I didn't know. You know, did the horses have bedding? Well, they did have bedding because Xenophon wrote something about horsemanship and he talks about the bedding, but he doesn't describe what it was. You know, he doesn't say that it was straw. Um, did the people have socks? They did have socks because Hesiod speaks about socks. Um, but you don't imagine the ancient Greeks in socks. So every time you turn around, there's like, you know, is somebody going to cut something? Do they have scissors? Uh, does somebody yeah. have a bucket? You know, it's, it's what did they eat and how many meals a day? And you can't take anything for granted. So you're constantly, mm -hmm. um, you know, even manure. You know, some people say that the, the discovery of using manure for fertilizer happened at a certain time and it was later in the Greeks. But, you know, the Greeks were so smart. Don't tell me they didn't use manure for fertilizer. So this ties in pretty well to what Katie was asking. Was there anything surprising you found during research? I think you kind of covered that. But she then asks, uh, was there anything interesting you found in research that you weren't able to include that you really wanted to? No, I mean, a lot of the stuff about women's lives was pretty interesting to me. Um, you know, it was, it was wild stuff, you know, like, you may have noticed in the Greek tragedies, the women are always hanging themselves. And that's, yeah. that's because um, the ancient Greeks thought that the body had symmetry, not only side for side, but top to bottom. And so this represents the uterus. And so, you know, the craziness of the uterus, which wanders around all Just the time. wanders anyway, all around. Yeah. And it makes women crazy. So you got to keep them pregnant. And you've got to make sure they can menstruate because otherwise they're going nuts. They're going yeah, nuts. It just, it just so, you know, you have, to, you have to kill yourself. And um, so there, there were interesting little things like that that I, I did not necessarily put in. Uh, they were not necessary. Um, I was interested in, in, in weaving and, and clothing because, you know, so many of my books said abruptly that clothing was very simple. And I didn't agree because if you read the dedication garments to a place like Brower on there, things like, you know, a violet, you know, spotted gown with smack. And I thought these women had nothing else to do in, in many cases. They were, they were weaving all day. I think they probably had a fiercely competitive, uh, extraordinarily virtuoso handling of clothes, but they haven't survived. Mm -hmm. And while I was researching, I, I found that some scraps had been found in Turkey that were about the right period. And they, they had little stag's heads this big woven into the fabric. Uh, and I also took clothes and tried to drape them to see if they would, you know, those pleats, they, they don't stay in pleats. Nothing stays in pleats unless you do something to it. So either all the artists were lying about the pleats going all the way down to the hem, or they found some way to get those pleats 
See, this is the problem. I am a dead bore when you ask me about ancient Greece, and it's because I spent four years learning everything I could because I had to, because I knew nothing. See, and I'm a terrible moderator because I just find this freaking fascinating. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, pleats, because kilts have pleats, but the pleats are very good and they stay in place. And how do those pleats stay in place on a kilt? I don't even know. So see, there you go. Yep. You just, you just get me off on a tangent. Uh, mm -hmm. Carla would like to inform you that you are never a bore. And I agree. Thank you, Carla. That's up to you. Um, so how did you decide who spoke in prose and who spoke in verse, asks Susan. Uh, I made it up as I went along. And so if something wasn't working in verse, uh, I tried prose and vice versa. But after a while, it became clear to me that Melisto um, was a very concrete person. And she wanted to be in prose until, you know, later in the book. Um, so, and I, I also needed a third person narrator for her because she was not only very young, but she is not at all introspective. In that sense, she's like the bear. She has these passions, but she doesn't, she doesn't think about them. Roscos is different. Roscos is very sensitive and, and always trying to figure out how to survive. Hmm. And he is introspective and he is thoughtful and he's figuring out who's got the power dynamics and how it works, but she doesn't. And so she wanted prose and he wanted the verse. Right. All right. I think I have one more question here. And, uh, and I've, I've been saving it to last because it is a big question. Uh, this one comes from Daisy. So I'm just going to lay it on you here. Did you learn about anything new about yourself? <sighs> that is a big question. Um, I think so because I, I wrote this book that I didn't think that I could write. I, I didn't think I was necessarily the right writer for this book, but it wouldn't go away. And I think other people turned it down. And um, when I was first starting work on this book, I had this dream about Frances Hodgson Burnett. Now, I, I actually love Frances Hodgson Burnett uh, to a degree that I'm not even proud of. Uh, but I've, I've read her adult novels, uh, some of which I, I still think are very funny, um, but some of which are just, you know, so sentimental that a normal person could not handle it. Um, but I really like Frances Hodgson Burnett and I dreamed I was in her house and her house was filled with little tchotchkes and there were velvet curtains and there were lace curtains and there were, you know, doll houses and there were little Madonnas and there was all this kind of stuff that was kind of soft and feminine and, and that I really liked, you know? And I realized that I was gonna have to get all that stuff out of the room if I could write this Greek book. I had to get rid of the Francis Hodgson Burnett part of my brain that likes all these things that are quaint and, and, and kind of cozy. And I have somewhere around here from the Oxford, um, I think it's the Oxford uh, Book of World Literature. It said that the six characteristics of Greek uh, Greek writing were simplicity and directness, subtlety of suggestion, a tendency to understatement, I'd rather overstate, an avoidance of sentimentality, I'm enormously sentimental, uh, close organization, and an architectural balance and meaning. So I wrote those in my thesaurus and um, I, I, I read them because I knew I, I had to, to write this book. I had to deal with a part of my brain that usually isn't mine. And when I finished the book, I, I hoped my editor wouldn't want a whole lot of um, corrections because uh, as I told her, there's not more where this came from. This was written from a strange part of my mind that I don't know how to get to necessarily. I've been informed that I froze a little during my question, but I like your answer so much. I'm not going to return to it. So, so there you go. And I said that was the last one, but actually I lied um, because that's what I do. 
Uh, so here's the actual last question. This comes from Katie. Do you have a dark side? Your stories have a little darkness that I absolutely love. A drowned maiden's hair, splendors and glooms, the night fairy. It's so refreshing to read as a parent. Is that crazy? It just feels like you give kids and adults more credit as a reader. Well, first of all, I have, I have huge respect for children because I work with them and they astonish me frequently with um, the inventiveness of their thought. I mean, they can be very literal one moment and the next minute pick up some big intuitive piece beautifully. So I, I never um, look down on children. I always, you know, put in big stuff, dark stuff and deliberate ambiguities. But as, as for my own person, I am um, angelically pure and um, I, I have no dark side. And um, uh, you, would, you would be hard put to hear a swear word leave my lips or um, a, a malicious statement or anything of that kind. I am, uh, I, I, I'm, like a, I'm like a white rabbit, quite harmless. <laughs> I don't believe a word you say, but we're going to go with it. Oh, one more question. One more question. What the hey? I can't resist these questions. They're just so good. Carla asks, and this is my last one. I swear to you, Scout's Honor, I swear. How do you feel when a book is finished, published, and out of your hands? Is there a sense of joy or disappointment or other? Um, when the book is in my hands, it's a miracle. <laughs> and I love that. Finishing a book is never as much fun as I think it's going to be, because I think it's, um, it seems wrong to compare anything as physical as the birth of a child to the birth of a book, but you work really hard in those last stages and, you know, you're cranky, you're really cranky by the time you get to the end, and I, I don't know whether it's you know, just fretfulness from not having slept enough and having sat too much in the chair and the fact that there's nothing good in the refrigerator and, you know, you just, you've just had it. So finishing a book never, you think, oh, when I finish my book, I'll be happy. Well, you never are. You feel like you want to bite somebody. Um, but when the book comes, when the book comes, or, or when people say something nice about the book, that is pure bliss. I cannot tell you how happy I have been. And that is a wonderful note to end on. So Leah, I'm going to turn it over back to you. Oh, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, I can listen to you both chat for hours. Um, I love all what you've been sharing. Thank you both so much. I guess that's all the time we have for questions. But I always like to throw out one more question to our guests. So before we wrap up, I'm just going to ask you both, what are you both reading now? I'm rereading a mixture of frailties. Um, I love Robertson Davies. And it's, it's one about a, a young girl who gets a kind of scholarship to travel in Europe and become a singer. And Robertson Davies you know, talks about the fact that she's, she's actually going to become a good second rate sit, s singer and how, how hard it is to be a second rate artist, how good you have to be even to be second rate. Uh, and also nobody in literature describes a bad party better than Robertson Davies. So I have that to look forward to. Uh, see, I mostly read children, so I'm reading right now The Year I Flew Away by Marie Arnold, um, which is this really nice, I have been enjoying the, the mix of, uh, of horror elements uh, with tradition, with like, with like black stories um, that we've been seeing. So this year we saw Root Magic was, was very good. Um, but The Year I Flew Away is great. I mean, it's just like, hello, metaphors about a girl <laughs> who moves to America, um, I believe from Haiti, and, uh, and she gets to New York City and she's living with her aunt and uncle and, and she encounters a witch in her building who says, 
I can I can help you fit in. I can help you with anything you want. Uh, and and gives her three slices of mango. And if she eats a slice of mango, she could Ooh. get her wish. Her wish and her first wish, but she she'll lose something, some small, some small something. She and she wishes that she didn't have an accent. Um, and she eats the mango and she and she doesn't have an accent anymore. But she can't understand her parents anymore. She can't. She's lost. Her old language. She has lost. Uh, she can't speak to her aunt and uncle anymore. She has to find ways around this, and it's got a very good uh, um, sort of animal companion, which is a rat because it's New York City, which we're talking in. And uh, and she's funny. She's funny character. She's a funny writer, and she does the audiobook. And just if you'll notice on the audiobook, she loses the accent when the character loses the accent. So the entire book is with the accent and then boom, she loses the accent and then the audiobook is without the accent. Oh, she, I want, I want her to do all, like all the readings of all the audiobooks from here on in. That's Marie Arnold. And I hear she was very funny uh, in, in, when you watch her live as well. So that's, that's what I'm reading. The Year I Flew Away. Oh, thank you both so much for sharing those titles. And of course, thank you both Laura and Betsy for joining us this evening and sharing your words and insights. Oh, you. Awesome. Um, and of course, thank you all so much viewers for joining us this evening. Don't forget, you can click on the link that we have in the chat box to get your own copy. If you haven't already of Laura's newest book, uh, Amber and Clay, remember that it'll come with a signed book plate um, while supplies last. Um, and also check out Betsy's amazing books, uh, pre-order her newest one coming out this fall. Um, also to find out about more events, check out our website for updated listings. You can follow our children and teen department on social media. We'll um, put those handles posted in the chat box as well. And you can also watch these past events as well as this one. You can watch it again on our Politics and Prose YouTube page. So again, thank you so much, everyone. Keep reading widely, expand your world and exploring new ones and sharing those amazing stories.